this program, we'll talk about the difference between a pump and a circulator, how a circulator works, and specifically what it does in a hydro... In this program, we'll talk about the difference between a pump and a circulator, how a circulator works, and specifically what it does in a hydraulic system, the different types of circulators, the parts of a circulator, and how each one affects the circulator's performance, plus how to read a pump performance curve, and use that information to choose the best circulator for whatever type of job you're working on. So first, let's ask the obvious question. Why should we care about a circulator or the details of how a particular circulator is designed and manufactured? That's an easy one. The circulator is a, the vital part of any hydraulic system. You really can't make a hydraulic system work without a circulator. Something has to make the water go round and round. And the circulator has that one purpose, and it has that one purpose only. It's to circulate the water in the system by creating flow. It creates flow by using centrifugal force to create a pressure differential. That's why sometimes you'll hear people call circulators centrifugal pumps. Now before we go any further, let's clear up a very common misunderstanding. We all tend to talk about pumps and circulators as if they're the same thing. Technically, they really aren't. The circulator doesn't lift water the way a well pump lifts water. It circulates water through a continuous loop system by creating a pressure differential. Water enters the circulator at a lower pressure. The circulator then accelerates the water and sends it back out at a higher pressure. It's important to make that distinction between a pump and a circulator, especially since we'll be discussing circulators that are used mainly in pressurized loop systems, systems like hydronic heating, radium floor heating, or domestic hot water recirculation. Now, we're not talking about multi-stage, multi-impeller style well pumps designed to lift water a few hundred feet out of the ground. This is a distinction that makes a difference when sizing or selecting a circulator for your hydraulic system, as we'll see later on. Okay, now that we're clear that pumps and circulators are different things, there are also several different types of circulators, each with its own design and best application. Some are wet rotors, some are dry. These dry circulators are also referred to as close coupled or three-piece circulators, by the way. Some need to be lubricated, others are self-lubricating. Some run fast, some run slow, while others can even vary their speed from fast to slow. In this course, however, we're going to focus on wet rotor circulators, and we'll use the Taco family of double O cartridge circulators as the great example of this type. Okay. Okay, let's review. The job of a circulator is to create flow in the system, right? Well, as we talked about earlier, water comes into the circulator at a lower pressure and leaves at a higher pressure. In other words, a pressure differential has been created. Now, that's when Mother Nature takes over. Mother Nature's the boss. A fluid must flow from an area of higher pressure to one of lower pressure. Mother Nature wants everything to be equal throughout the system. Now, it works the same way in your hydraulic system as it does on the maps of, let's say, the weather channel. Now, those low pressure areas that bring storms draw from the high pressure areas that give us clear skies, which causes the wind to blow. The greater the pressure differential between high and low areas, the higher the flow of wind. And the weather systems try to equalize overall barometric pressure between them. In very simple terms, without that pressure differential, you would have virtually no wind and very little change in the weather. In a hydronic system, it's kind of the same thing, only different. The greater the pressure differential, the greater the rate of flow. The magic comes in when designing a system and then selecting a circulator so that the appropriate amount of flow approaches the system. This is an overview of the Taco double O family cartridge circulator in the appropriate. So remember always the pump comes after the expansion tank. And after the, the pen, don't put the pump before the expansion pen. I'll, I will repeat that in the expansion pen because uh, the, the pump will lose pressure if it goes through the expansion pen first. And uh, I've seen that question. Uh, well, well, Here's an overview of the Taco 00 family cartridge circulator in action. 
You can see that the water enters the casing, also known as the balloon, right about here. Then the water is pulled into the eye of the impeller, and the impeller drives it to the outside. This force to the outside is the centrifugal force. It's this action that adds velocity to the water, and along with the shape of the balloon, creates the higher pressure before the water leaves the circulator over here. Let's take a closer look at the cartridge inside a 00 circulator. This replaceable cartridge contains all of the moving parts, which is what makes the 00 circulator so easy to service in the field. Now, the 00 circulator is water lubricated. There's always water inside the cartridge. That's what we mean when we say a 00 is a wet rotor circulator. There's no need for oil or grease or anything like that. It's just like having oil lubricate the engine pistons in your car. The system water lubricates the bearing inside the circulated cartridge. Now, it may sound like a contradiction that the self-contained field replaceable cartridge containing all of the moving parts always has water in it, but it really isn't. You can see here that the impeller is mounted on a hollow ceramic shaft. As the system is filled and pressurized during initial startup, system water is forced into the empty cartridge through that hollow ceramic shaft and in turn the air is forced out. Once the system is filled and pressurized, small amounts of air will remain in the cartridge. It's important to run the circulator for at least a few minutes when installing it so that remaining air is purged from the cartridge. The spinning of the rotor and hence the shaft and impeller connected to it creates a centrifugal suction that will replace the air with water. Once the cartridge is full of water, the hollow ceramic shaft acts as a mini expansion deck. It provides the exact amount of space needed for the water in the cartridge to expand and contract as it heats and cools, without bringing in new system water into the cartridge. That way, you aren't continually running the system water across your moving parts. This gets to be particularly important as the system ages and particles like black iron oxide build up in the system. It's also important to consider the quality of the water when you first fill and pressurize the system or replace a cartridge. You want that water to be clean and free of any debris, sand, particles, gunk, etc. because over time that will create wear in the circulator. If you put in a new circulator and fill it with dirty water, it's like buying a new car and putting the oil from your old clunker into the new crankcase. So just be mindful of water quality and make sure you use the cleanest available. Well, that's the over. mentioned before, the size of the motor, its horsepower rating, directly affects its performance. A circulator with a more powerful motor will produce more pressure and more flow than a circulator with a smaller motor. Now here's the motor from a 007. It's rated at 125th horsepower, and we can see on the performance curve that it has a top range of 20 gallons per minute and 11 feet of head. Now here's the motor from a 0014 circulator. It's rated at 1 8 horsepower. It has a top range of 32 gallons per minute and 22 feet of head. When you look at the 00 circulators overall, you see that Keiko pays a lot of attention to the detail and builds in a lot of features to make sure that you and your customers get the reliable performance that you want and expect. Let's take a look at some of the other things you may find in or attached to the circulator. First of all, they make it very easy for you to install any 00 circulator quickly and easily because of the universal flange to flange dimension here. This really solves a lot of potential problems when you're looking at a retrofit application. The direct drive design means that all 00 circulators use very little power for their capacity, so they're very energy efficient, obviously a characteristic that your customers are particularly interested in these days. Remember the cartridge design we talked about earlier? Well, this stainless steel cartridge contains all of the circulator moving parts, and the cartridge is field replaceable. Just unscrew these four bolts, okay, holding the motor can and the volute together, and you remove the cartridge. If anything ever goes wrong with the circulator, you can just swap out the cartridge, and bingo, you rebuilt the circulator in a matter of minutes, and you've never disturbed the piping. Now, maintenance can't get any easier than that another thing you and your customer find to like. 
Now, another component you'll find in circulators today that I want to point out to you is the integral flow check, the IFC, and that's right here in the circulator. First of all, it eliminates the installation cost of putting in a separate inline flow check. Second, it improves the performance because of its location and the lower amount of force it takes to open it compared to a conventional weighted check valve. Any Seiko circulator can be operated with or without an IFC, and all of the casings are machined to accept an IFC. Even if it isn't originally ordered with the pump, it literally snaps in, snaps out for field installation. Other common items include switches to change the speed of the circulator, like with the Taiko 0010 three-speed service circulator. The advantage of a three-speed circulator is that it has three separate performance curves in one package. In the case of the 0010, it allows you the flexibility to dial in a specific curve to make short work of circulator replacement on a service call, since it replaces most of the commonly used circulators you're about to find out there. You may also see circulators with timers and aquastats attached for hot water circulation loops or circulators with circuit boards. The ever-expanding array of circuit board-driven circulators means application-specific controls can be built right in. Seiko has circulators that include a single-zone relay control built in, this is perfect for adding an indirect water heater, let's say. <coughs> we also have a number of variable speed circulators to improve the overall system performance and energy savings. There are also special solar circulators with built-in differential controllers. So no matter the job, there's a wet rotor circulator designed to fit. Wet rotor cartridge circulators are also very versatile. They work great in all kinds of jobs, from small to large residential applications and light commercial jobs as well. Use them in hydronic heating systems, raising floor heating systems, indirect domestic hot water heating, solar systems, heat recovery, water source heat pumping, domestic water recirculation, chilled water cooling systems, all of these. With flow capacities ranging from zero to more than 30 gallons per minute, and a head range ranging from zero to 34 feet, there's a double O wet rotor circulator that's just right for virtually any job you're likely to tackle. Now the question is, how do you choose a circulator? That's his question. GPM. Yeah. GPM for the pump, which is BTU hour. Over 500, which is conversion rate times job T, then pump head. <coughs> so I printed here six problems. We we'll work on together, and it should help us understand how these are done. I will use the cover length method where we. Everybody has the pump chart that I gave you last week. Uh -huh. Who does it? Get up. 
the uh, the with inverted P doesn't have a factor, it just carries over n. Example. Combination, probably there is no diversity for, for half an inch. Probably there is no diversity for half an inch. It's too small. Oh, okay. Half an inch very small. So just ten. Doesn't doesn't have to no have factor. So it's changed the five size. <coughs> you have to have one. Okay, let's look at the first one. Two-story house, ceiling is eight feet. Again, I'm going to be more concerned with the numbers. Two-story house, ceiling is eight feet, the pipe size half an inch throughout the house. Total length of the pipe is 180 feet. Below is the number of fittings in the pump. Uh, it has to supply hot water to 33,000 BTU room. And there are the following fittings. So half an inch do not have diabetes. So we're not gonna include that, we'll do something else. Uh, and also, this is too small. So first of all, I wanna find the GPM. So floor rate and GPM. What is the BTU? 33. Temperature difference. Not giving. What is the standard? Twenty. Why? Excellent, guys. What do you got? Three point three. Three point three. Down for a minute. Okay. So we got the GPM. Now we have to find the pump head. Pump head. Static head plus friction plus fitting. What is the static in this case? 16. 16 to 2 times 8. Friction and fitting we have to calculate. So friction. In order to find the LE, that will be total length of the pipe. What is the total length from the question? 180 feet. In real life, you'll go and measure the length of feet that you will put up for the project. Estimate all the length, and that's your length. Plus converting 90 degree elbow. It's copper, right? Yeah, copper. So I go to half an inch and 90 degree about is one. So that is 30 times one plus 30. There's no diversity, so if you look here, there's none. You cannot put diversities on those systems, so we got to have another mm -hmm. option, so it's not there. What about bow valve? Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. What's LE and AD, what, what does that hold? You have the formula sheet that I gave you twice. Yeah. What is it? Okay. Formula sheet. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Ellie, 
We said uh, 30 times uh, 1. Then we have 12 valves, 10 ball valves, and each one is 1 1.9. So, if you don't have it, I will print another one for you for class. But uh, please keep it with you because it has all the formulas to make things easier. And if you're bringing it with you, it's a quiz. So, we get the ball valves, we get uh, its copper, that's it, we don't have anything else. So, I'm done. That's just to find the LE. So what I got? Two point two nine. Huh? I think it's two point two nine, right? For this thing? No, I guess we're just for the LE. Um, two twenty nine. Two twenty nine? Okay. Two twenty nine feet. I'm gonna put that back into the equation here. It's very systematic, step by step. All the information is for you, just to look up. So I'm gonna go back and do the friction hit it, friction. Plus settings. So 229. What is A? They go into the Copper, two of here. Yeah. Half an inch within range. Water temperature is 180. Where do we get the time water temperature? If it's not giving it 180. Standard water temperature is 180. So if I, if I don't have a number for the delta D, I'll do 20. No, okay. And you have a number for the water, it's usually 180. So now 180 is about 1.478. So where do we get to the, um, oh, I know, remember, never mind. Okay, what is the GPA? Oh, well, uh, what is the GPA? Yeah. What is the number here? It does not change that much. Well, 0.75. Where'd you get the 1.75? Really? Oh, yeah. Okay, we got the number. I'll plug it into the calculator. Yeah. Yeah. We can do it individually. Well, I don't. I don't know. You can put the for 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 length by itself. Then you can put the fitting as. Which way do you want? I don't want to do it. This is much easier. Okay. Don't put things to length. I put in the equation. Yeah. It's just like let's create it. Yeah. But if you just if you have the equation in front in front of you, you have the table. You have the number. Just click and go step by step. I will show you the other way. So find the easier one. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, show you. Yeah, take that. Huh? What about it? That is the length of the pipes and the conversion of the elbows into length. Okay. 
I will show you the other methods just to convince you. You can find the GPM and head using the table. That's, a, that's called the quick selector method, which basically you look up the baseball, you look up the pipe, then you have to go and find something fitting off shelf. But again, it's not uh, it's not very accurate, and the look at you does not work, and they tell you that this method is not accurate. There's a second one. It's called the milli inch method, which for the life of me, I would never be able to understand what does that mean. So you're gonna have to go for calculate the pressure for each pipe, and using the milli inch, you can go and find the forehead and head. It's the second method you can use. And this is what called the IVR method. Which is still you're going to couple up GPM and use the left part for the pipe to find the head and GPM. And more table lookup. So this one you can size the trunk and the branches, then you go and come to the pump. Oh, yeah. Good? Yeah. Question? <clears throat> is that 20 like constant? Like is that like Yes. Yeah. Okay, if it's not provided, 20 as the guy said also is a, is a, a key one. So this is another method called the IVR. Uh, this is the one we're using, it's called the equivalent length. And if you see this equation, it's also in the IVR. And the tail, this is the most. These are all that fixed. So then how do we find the GPM from here though? Whatever works for you, I don't need to get yours. So for now I'm, I want to explain the equivalent method, that's what I'm going with, because I feel it's the most uh convenient way to do it. And that requires some math. Any question about this? So, the last one we didn't have great teeth. Yeah, so it does. So, we feel comfortable? Can we do another one? No. So, pain in the ass, man. I'm not even sure. Pain in the butt. They're all this is This is the, the best way to do it. And, uh, as you can see, it's better. So what's the static? The static is 80. That's the height. Static right here is the height from the basement so to the. Two floors. Yeah. Each one, each one is 8. Did you divide each one by 100? Yeah. So it's 16? Yeah. So. That's plus the fitting. So this is the answer for doing all this together. Huh? Why not? So I'll, I'll do it one by one, just to make sure that everything, everybody got each number correctly. So this is going to be,
Yeah. Well, only find, the only part I might find a little bit challenging is just to the power of 1.75. And I did look at the calculator and show you it's the hat symbol. It looks right. And that's the hat. Or looks like that. So, it's how it runs. If you have a question, let me know. We'll do five more on Wednesday. I'll have to do a check. And, uh, yeah, I think it's the most, as, uh, as long as it is, the best way to do it. Oh, So I'm gonna do this one. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's called because we are converting the elbow to the sugar plate. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I could follow the, the steps, but I wanted to know, like, what's this 500? 500 is conversion. Yes, like, it's going to be always 500. It's always, okay. 20 is always going to be 20, unless you, yeah, unless you get some different, different temperature difference. Uh, as the guy said, 20 usually for radiators, then for radiant floor, and you have more or less just for him there. Uh, yeah, for radiant floor, So it's always going to be a three point. Oh, no. Is that LE the feet the 180? Huh? Is that 180 the feet? The first. This one? Yeah. Yeah, that's feet. That's feet. Okay. 
the, the, the length of the pipe, right? Well, hi, is that, was that the length of the pipe? It was taking mean value for question one. What's up?